John chapter 19, beginning with the 30th verse. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses over the Sabbath, because that Sabbath was a particularly important day. They asked Pilate to have the man's legs broken and the bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who was crucified with Jesus and then those of the other man. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately blood and water came out. The one who saw it has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. Indeed, these things happened so that the Spirit, the Scripture, would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Again, another Scripture says, they will look at the one they have pierced. The Word of our Lord. Friends, those counted beloved in the name of our Savior Jesus to our Lord and Christ and his Father, who is our Father and ruler over all. Grace and peace. Imagine a room where you can demolish, bash, smash, break, shatter to pieces whatever you like. It's actually a new fad. It's called a break room or a smash room. They're popping up in cities everywhere. Just imagine if you brought in something that really at times frustrates you, like a copier or a printer or an alarm clock. Maybe if you're an L.A. Rams fan, maybe even an Indianapolis Colts fan, a cardboard frame of Tom Brady, that's been done. And you're allowed to do that in this break room or smash room. You might wonder about the morality of that. Is that fair? It might be good if you're not going to go home and break things or people, you're going to go to this room intentionally just to release some steam. But do we really want to break things and, and let that inner part of ourselves out? Is that healthy? Is that good? And maybe that's debatable, but this is not. Things get broken. And by the way, people break things. It's sinners who break things. It's people like you and me. It doesn't take a special person to break God's heart by your sin. And that's what we see in this evening's text is not that Jesus' bones were broken. It's not that God's word was broken or his plan of salvation. Those things remained intact to fulfill the scriptures, which he'd been doing all along. Tonight we consider the broken heart of God. Our journey ends as it began. When we started Lent, we heard a series of sayings from Jesus. He said it more than once. He said that he would be spat on, he would be mocked, he would be ridiculed. He would be tortured. He would be put to death on a cross. He would go to his death and he would rise again. That's exactly what Jesus said would happen. Should we be so surprised as we try both to frown and to smile on Good Friday? This day of all days when the creator of heaven and earth is suspended between them on a cross where law and gospel meet, where God's wrath and his love meet, where our sorrows and our joy meet here at the cross. 
where death is found and where it may not look like it, but death dies a miserable death itself. It was in fulfillment of prophecy. And there are a lot of places to go, a lot of prophecies to fulfill, but Jesus is here to fulfill every one of them, just ticking them off of the list. And you see it so clearly and so beautifully in Isaiah chapter 53. We just, we just heard it as if Isaiah was there, a prophet 700 some years before Jesus, painting this picture. It's like the Spirit has transported Isaiah to the foot of the cross just to tell us how it's going to be. How there's a man of sorrows. How there he is hanging on his shoulders the government of this world of sin, crushing him down because of you and because of me. Later on in Isaiah 63, we've got the same suffering servant treading out the, the grapes. And as I look at him, the grape juice is not grape juice, it's blood. Fulfilling prophecy. Tick, 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 tick. You can just see it. You can just almost smell it as you, as you read it in the scriptures. Psalm 22. Another very good place to go. King David predicts crucifixion before they even invent it. He's a thousand years before Christ, before Rome was ever founded and this particular torture was ever put together. He's talking about hands pierced and feet. Can you, can you imagine a God who transcends time and eternity to do this? Who would do such a thing? Because when you sit back and you look at all those prophecies, what, what you see is God telling us beforehand, not just that things are going to be fulfilled, but it's going to hurt. And it's not going to hurt you and me. It's going to hurt Him. Who would do this? Who would give these prophecies to their own pain and to their own hurt? to their own torture and suffering. His heart must really be broken over our sin. He must really love sinners. It goes on as we see the story, exactly what happened on Good Friday. He was there of his own free will. That was clear in the prophecies. He was there without any constraint that was clear by him finally making this resolute journey to Jerusalem to be pinned to a, the wood of a cross, this stick of wood that really had no business in a world of morality, in a, in a world of justice. Not for this man. And all that remains is the promise of resurrection. Do you have any doubt that he would fulfill that too? Not you, Christian believer. Because you've seen every other prophecy fulfilled in this God, in this man. We don't doubt it for a second. After all, would you pay for a coat? Would you pay for a nice pair of sneakers? Would you pay for a TV and then just leave it at the store? Would you take out a mortgage and pay it monthly just to live with your family on the streets? You wouldn't do those things. Would you pay for a flight, a vacation, or a cruise, and then not show up, not even go? Why would the Lord of life go to death for us and not rise again? That'd be like leaving your goods where you bought them. Of course that's going to happen. It's going to happen for our Savior and for you and for me. <clears throat> now maybe this looms in our hearts as we look around at the sinful world because we don't always look so deeply at Good Friday. We don't always keep it in our hearts. Other things loom like, what if the Lord forgets about me? Does that loom in your heart? Do you ever ask questions like, what if, like others I've loved, he breaks my heart and leaves me just because he saves good people or better people than I? What if he bears in mind now 
how eager I was as a lamb to wander away? What if he remembers how much I wanted to go off on my own path, on my own errant path, and stumble and fall? What if he remembers how I made his blessings my very own break room of sin? How I made my own world a disaster by my own hands, by my own words, by my own thoughts? If that's the case, we haven't looked very closely on Good Friday. He didn't do all this to forget about you, friend. He didn't do all this to leave sinners behind in the dust. He didn't do all this to leave that crushing burden of all of your trespasses and iniquities, the times you crossed over God's line, the times you were weighed down with guilt and sorrow, and just leave you behind. He didn't do that. His heart was broken to leave you trusting him. Haven't you heard the promise? Haven't you heard that whoever believes in this man on the cross, after all, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, this man, that you'll not perish but have eternal life. You've heard that, haven't you? Haven't you heard that the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin? You've heard that, haven't you? Haven't you heard that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law? Don't you know? This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The righteous shall live by faith. You've heard these things before, haven't you? Those are nice promises. The word promises it in countless ways that we are saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. The burden is off, brothers and sisters. Take that deep sigh of relief. Good Friday is at the end of the week, but it's also at the end of the Savior's life. It's at the end of your life, too. It's waiting for you. It's there promising, fulfilling, sharing with you the victory and the hope of the resurrection. His heart broke on a cross for us after all. What's left to earn? Nothing for you. Not to earn. Simply to trust and simply to believe. And that's not all. When it's your turn to suffer pain, he doesn't leave you or forsake you. He's promised this, that when everyone else around you leaves, he remains. When sorrow shadows your every move, either because of your sins or others, he doesn't abandon you, for he promised it. And as we've learned, he fulfills his promises. A mother might forget her infant, just might. But our Savior God, our Messiah, will never forget us because he's marked our names in the palms of his hand. That was predicted in the Old Testament, too. Mountains could fall in the ocean, and they could melt in magma, but his love remains for you forever and ever and ever. He himself will be with you to the end of your days. It is Good Friday, and the hill of Golgotha is veiled in black because the sun refuses to shine on its creator. It is Good Friday. And the people at the cross beat their chests out of their love for their Savior, who they knew should not be here, should not be pinned to this wood. It is Good Friday, and you will go home beating your chests, too, because of your mixed emotions today. But you will also go home with the joy of a promise, with the hope that it, too, will be fulfilled, a promise that we can, we can only just whisper today, but that we'll sing together in two, three days from now, after that tomb is open. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Go now, friends, with hearts pounding for that joy tonight, for his heart broke to give you that promise too. Amen.